Good morning and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining this early morning session at the World Economic Forum 2023. It's great to have you here in the room and thanks and warm welcome for everybody who is following the stream and following this session live. This year's Davos annual meeting marks the world's leaders' biggest post-pandemic gathering. It was three years ago when in January 2020, the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern. And despite many efforts to learn from the pandemic during these three years and some of the world leaders declaring the end of it, it still represents a big risk and surely does not seem like it is over. During this session, we will evaluate the state of the pandemic, the increase in cases globally, as well as the consequences and impact on the healthcare system worldwide. It's my great honor to introduce the speakers of the session. Here with me we have Maria Leptin, President, European Research Council, Seth Berkeley, Chief Executive Officer Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, Stefan Bensel, Chief Executive Officer at Moderna, and Michelle Williams, the Dean of the Faculty, Harvard Chan School of Public Health. By the end of the session, we're going to also hear the closing remarks about Shyam Bishan, had shaping the future of health and healthcare, member of Executive Committee at the World Economic Forum. My name is Sasha Vakulina, I'm with Euronews, and I'm going to be moderating this session. By the end of it, we're going to have the possibility to get some questions from the audience, so get ready, you're going to just need to raise your hand. If you want to get in touch, if you're with us uh, online, you, had used, you can use the hashtag WAF23 and the team will be able to, to get your view and comments on that. Uh, without further ado, let's just jump straight to the discussion. And Michelle, I would like to start with you, please. Uh, let's set the scene here and let's try to evaluate the current state of the pandemic globally and the risks of these rather premature claims that the pandemic is over. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Sasha. Good morning, everyone. And I'm really delighted to see this room full because it means that, you know, COVID uh, fatigue has not fully set in and that people are still interested and eager and um, um, committed to appreciating that this pandemic is not over. Far from it, actually. And I would say that we have to also be grateful that, you know, advances in therapeutics and vaccines um, have really allowed us to reopen our society. And I think part of the enthusiasm comes from the fact that we are able to have gatherings like this again um, after a long period of disruption. So setting the context, we still in the United States have 526 deaths per year from per day, COVID. Per day, per day sorry, <laughs> per day from COVID. And, and that's up since November, October, where we were in the 400s. Now, what's really disappointing is nine out of 10 of those deaths could be averted if we took our vaccines and boosters and practiced the other behavioral aspects, ventilation, mask wearing when appropriate, distance, and so on. And so for me as a, as a public health person, knowing that we could avert nine out of 10 of those deaths um, reminds me of the fact that we have to avoid prematurely talking about this pandemic being over. I also think that the context, in when we talk about context, we must also discuss the more chronic implications of this pandemic. We must discuss the fact that there's, in the U.S. alone, over 174,000 COVID infants uh, will have a life life course that's impacted by this pandemic. We also have to consider the fact that long COVID is a reality. And it's not only going to be impacting individuals and families, but the economic impact of long COVID as um, quantified by um, Larry Summers and, and David Cutler, both of Harvard, is that it's gonna cost us $3.7 trillion. <coughs> Um, and that's gonna have financial impacts. So my bottom line is this pandemic is far from over. Um, thanks to therapeutics and diagnostics and vaccines, we are able to reclaim you know, much of civil society and our economy and our educational system. Our healthcare system is still under stress. And what I hope people will understand is the vaccine not only protects ind individuals from transmission and severity, 
but it protects our health systems. We're able to have a functional or almost functional health system because we don't have the kinds of severe disease that we were facing in 2020. And we need to also recognize that our health systems have to recover as well. We have burnout uh, from our healthcare workers and we have case mixes of chronic diseases that are worse now and require more intensive medical intervention than before. So the impact and the context is diverse and wide, um, widespread, and also we have to think about the chronic implications on our health systems and our financial systems workforce. Absolutely, and we're gonna discuss that a little later to go into more details, because it's, as you said, such an important aspect with the total, if I may say, calling it the burnout of the whole of the health system generally. Let's, um, let's talk a little about vaccination. And I want to go for the next question to Seth Berkeley. Let's assess the results of the COVID-19 vaccine delivery partnership, because this is the initiative from Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, UNICEF, the World Health Organization, to support and accelerate vaccine delivery in low and middle income countries. This is such an important issue. Let's try to, to see where we are there with, with this program for Seth. So thanks, Sasha. And let me start, first of all, it's great to be back in person. Three years ago, we sat here in Davos and they, we didn't know where this was gonna go. There were some political leaders saying, you know, it's going nowhere. Um, but um, Stefan was part of the conversation and, and Richard Hatchett and I sat down and said, the last pandemic with flu, the developing world got no vaccines. They were all bought up by wealthy countries. So we knew that was what was gonna happen if this turned into a global pandemic. And so we started this concept of COVAX, which we brought lots of other people into. And the idea was to try to solve that problem. Um, first of all, the science was amazing. I'm sure Stefan will talk about that. 327 days, if you had asked us, we had thought maybe we could get there 18 months, two years. So extraordinary. Um, you know, advancements in, in the science. Um, but on the policy side as well, we, we did our first dose in the developing world 39 days after the first dose was done in a wealthy country. Of course, it should be the same day, but that's, you know, a record. And what we were able to do then was to bring um, doses to the developing world. Now, it wasn't smooth, it didn't go well, um, uh, but in the first year, we um, had put a goal together of 950 million doses, because that's what we thought we could get for, for a low and lower middle income countries. And we ended up with about 930 million doses. So we came close to that. Today, um, uh, the lower income countries, the half of the countries that are lower income, have a, a coverage rate of 53% of primary vaccination, as opposed to a global total of 64%. So absolutely not equity. And particularly in the elderly, a 66% coverage should be way higher health workers better, 81% coverage. But to answer your question, on, on uh, we realized that given the disparities were still there at the beginning of 2022, there were 34 countries with less than 10% coverage. And we intensified a program, um, both providing finance and technical assistance. And today there are seven countries with less than 10% coverage. And, and as you can imagine, six of those are quite fragile countries with fragile health systems. So one of the challenges is how to take a system that, we, you know, we at Gavi provide vaccines for um, about half of the world's children, but those are mostly pediatric vaccines. We do campaigns for yellow fever and, and, and epidemic diseases in, in um, older populations, but for routine, there is no routine system for adults. So what countries had to do is adapt their systems, use their health workers. It's one of the reasons there's burnout. Of course, there were also a lot of health worker deaths, and, and these are challenges that we should talk about. Um, the problem we have right now is since the beginning of 2022, we've had enough vaccines to provide whatever countries want, the challenge has been getting the demand. Part of it is the world says, you know, we're done with, um, with, with COVID. Of course, the virus is not done with us, as Michelle said. And um, what we really need to do is make sure that policymakers understand that, you know, we're continuing to see new variants and we've been lucky that we haven't had one with very severe disease or one that can escape existing immunity. 
But there's no reason to think that that may not happen. So the best thing we can do is use the preventing methods, but also make sure we vaccinate our high-risk populations so they're protected against severe disease and death. Let's go more a little bit into the new variants and subvariants. And I'm going to go with uh, Stefan Bansel. Uh, let's talk about vaccine development, because we've heard how it happened, obviously, with COVID-19 starting from 2022, and how extraordinary the process was also in terms of the speed. How is development, adoption, and scaling of vaccine going on when it comes for different variants and subvariants? Because this is one of the big concerns as, we, as we're all here now, and we're discussing, we, we understand the context, and this is a great deal. Sure. Uh, good morning, and thank you for having me on the panel. Um, so the great news versus 2020, where we are today, is we have manufacturing capacity. As Seth knows, when the pandemic happened, Moderna had made 100,000 doses in 2019 for the whole year. And I remember walking after Davos into the office of my head of manufacturing, and I say, how do we make a billion doses next year? And they look at me a bit funny, say, what? I uh, say, so yeah, we need to make a billion dollars next year. There's going to be a pandemic. Um, and so where we are now is, you know, we have plants in the U.S. and in Switzerland. We've shown this summer that we're able to adapt to variants very quickly. Um, if you think about it, you know, in the U.S., Peter Marx uh, told us on June 28, we want for the U.S. a BA5 Omicron uh, uh, booster. And by early September on Labor Day weekend, he was in U.S. pharmacies which kind of 60 days, which kind of, in the old world of vaccines, uh, will have been years. Yeah. Yes, five years, easily. unthinkable. Um, and I was just telling Seth uh, before the, uh, this discussion that I'm very excited that over Christmas, Moderna bought a Japanese company uh, that has developed a new technology, new science from Tokyo University to shrink by two more weeks the time to get from deciding the sequence to having products ready. So it will not be ready for this summer for the, uh, the booster that we're going to need in the fall of 23. But potentially by the fall of 24, it might be ready. And so we keep on working on technologies to improve that. The other piece that we are working on also, because uh, Seth and I had many, many discussions over the last three years, as you can imagine, uh, is how do we uh, build manufacturing capacity around the world? You know, we had a lot of export restriction during the pandemic. Uh, which was really, really painful for a lot of obvious reasons. Uh, even from countries who say we will not limit exports, trust me, they were. Um, and so uh, we are very excited now that we are building a factory in Canada. We already broke ground in the fall. We are building a factory in Australia. Uh, we are going to start a factory this quarter in the UK. And we're also going to start building a factory in Kenya. We are talking to a couple more countries because I would really like on every continent to have mRNA capacity, because the amazing thing about mRNA is you can use the same facility, the same plant, the same machines to uh, make any vaccine you want. For example, you know, last night we announced we have positive data on our RSV vaccine for phase three, with a very high 84% you know, efficacy on the vaccine. As many of you know, there's no vaccine against RSV, and too many people get sick and, and die every, every year of RSV, both in the elderly and also it's a big problem for toddlers. And so, we can use exactly the same machines in the same plant to make the other vaccine. So the flexibility is what I think also gives me hopes, not only for the variants that nature might throw at us, but also for other vaccines. Well, it's, it's interesting how you say that, you know, three years ago, some of this speed and some of those days, and how you say this, and now we can speed it up even more. Something like that was not even possible or thinkable to be discussed three years ago, even when, when we went into COVID, right? But uh, Maria, let's... I want to bring it to a little bit of a different aspect with you here because COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. illustrated also the difficulties and the risks of science denial. And three years into it, we're still having lots of that. And this is such an important issue here, the highlighted importance of science. And I know you're passionate about that. How do you see the situation now? Has it improved or not? Um, I wish it had improved. Okay. I am passionate about science. And it's an interesting question. Um, perhaps interestingly, two of the countries which were most successful in getting good coverage of vaccination based this not at all on getting their citizens to try and understand the signs. One is Bhutan, which, uh, where they were very successful in preparing a campaign 
and involved. They asked, they, they were sensitive to the country's needs, to the citizens' needs, involved in form from informing the religious establishment, and in fact using them in finding the right time and date. And they got fantastic coverage. No science was explained. The other example I know of um, is Portugal, where the um, campaign was handed to a retired army general. And the army general just treated the country as his troops, and he rallied the troops. He declared it as a war that the country, in patriotic passion, was going to fight together. And they had up there, I think they were leading in Europe, if not the world. So, no science. Let's remember that. Good planning, good uh, uh, you know, thinking and integration in one country, and the right sort of attitude in another. Um, Scientists, we scientists, uh, and I'm totally behind the scientists who were asked constantly at the beginning of the campaign, we did what scientists do. We expressed our knowledge and our uncertainty. I mean, uh, the, 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 the spoof on this in Don't Look Up was wonderful, you know? 93% certain means 7% possible that the comment won't. Why should we worry? And so I, I don't blame any of the scientists, neither in my own country, Germany, nor Fauci in America, or any of the scientists who pronounced publicly. The trouble is that many citizens don't understand uncertainty as part of the scientific method. And if I say today, this is my best belief with that uncertainty, and somebody else says tomorrow, you didn't do that experiment right, you didn't, that's the way we are. So we've got to go so profoundly into educating citizens about the scientific method if we want better trust in science. And the bad news is, who is it going to be? It's not going to be us because we're the ones who are mistrusted. I'm now a Brussels scientific official. You represent academia, I can never trust them. Industry, even worse. I mean, maybe Seth is the only one who can be halfway trusted up here. Yeah, we have here, so, right? Yeah, right. So what I'm saying is, if we want to address those who don't, who, who, who have this mistrust in science, we're the wrong ones, and we've got to start somewhere completely else. But let's expand this. It's such an important issue when it comes to the distrust in science, and I want to address all the speakers here. If that's not up to you, who can do that better? And how can we make this more of an organized way to get better results at the end? Let me, let me, yes. let me start, because I think it's really important. Um, the worst thing we did in the US was when people expressed hesitancy or curiosity we basically said to them, follow the science. And that's the absolute wrong thing to do. What you have to do if you're really interested in communicating information that will motivate people to change their behavior, you have to take the approach of it, meeting them where they are, explaining it, and presenting the information in a way where they will adopt the desirable behavior and feel good about it. And maybe that was the secret sauce to what happened in Portugal and in Bhutan. Health communicators and scientists worked to communicate the risks and what we understand today. And in doing that, help people understand that the scientific process is iterative. And not all of us are math literate, so when we speak in probability, we are going to lose our audience. So all of us have to begin to realize that we have to stop our professional scientific speak or engage others who can translate for us and meet people where they are. If we do that, it'll be the stepping stone of building trust. Governance, We're getting regulation and governance and national leadership really did not help us. But, but I mean, it also was, I mean, if you look at vaccine hesitancy in a normal time frame, people think this is a problem in the developing world. It tended not to be a problem in the developing world because you, know, you look to your friends and colleagues and you see the diseases. And so every parent, every person wants the protection. The big problem was in places where vaccines were so effective that the diseases had disappeared. And then you can say, well, do I want to take this vaccine that has a side effect or is it organic or does it have this or that? And, and, and that was where we were that was so, was so interesting. What, what you didn't mention, 
was um, the intentionality, the politicization of the process. There was also, um, you know, attacks that were done. There were, you know, bots in social media that were putting out misinformation on both sides. And lastly, and this is what's completely different, is today a rumor spreads literally at the speed of a light. So what happens is you have in, you know, my own country, Michelle's talking about the US, I'm obviously American, although I live in Switzerland. Um, it was amazing the amount of misinformation that was there. And that information then went straight to the rest of the world. And so all of a sudden you have the way we normally deal with misinformation is we get the local chief, the local religious leader, the local healthcare workers who are trusted, but all of a sudden they're like, but, but look at what's going on in Germany or in the US or in other places, and here's what I'm getting in my, you know, my social media, and that has been a real problem. So the trust goes even broader. We don't trust the institutions, we have misinformation, and it's getting worse, not better. The extent of this misinformation when it, came, when it comes to vaccination, I think, has, as a, somebody who works in the media, I, I mean, that was just overwhelming to see all of that across all the channels, right? Yes, and I exactly agree with panelists, which is, I think, in some countries, you know, you saw scientific debate in national TV at prime time. So you can imagine how people were scared. You know, Ben has I've said, you know, a lot of political debate in some countries, and the U.S. was kind of maybe one of the worst places in the world. And you saw the differences of countries where all the parties would say, you know, this has been approved by the regulators, clinical studies have been done, you should get your, 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 your vaccines and so on. And then, as I've said, I mean, the social media was just terrible, uh, just terrible. And so at a time of uncertainty where people were scared for their loved ones, you know, many people, you know, locked down. Uh, it, it was very hard for everybody from a just mental health standpoint. Uh, when you, you capitalize with all that environment, you could see some countries where you had scientific debate and political debate and social media, if you had those three things, the vaccine rate were very, very low. Absolutely. And now let's go into what Michelle just mentioned. Let's talk a bit more about the health governance, because at the end of the day, this is the bigger picture that has so many elements into it. We, nobody, I think, in this room can deny the importance of health governments, and yet it's not perfect. What are the next steps and elements needed to improve it as much as it is possible? Yeah, you know, I would argue just opening this response is we have to really embrace ourselves and engage in rethinking, taking the lessons learned, and transforming our systems. Um, on global health governance, we know this, and we knew this before the pandemic, that the WHO has a mandate that far exceeds the budget to execute on that mandate. But it's not just funding. It's the multilateral agreements that have to be brought forward. So there has to be mindset shifting in what it means to engage in multilateral agreements around global health issues. And there has to be real improvements in the infrastructure and the finances and the workforce. And that's going to take leadership. And it's going to take a commitment to true multilateral engagement. Um, and we have to have people who are committed to the exercise of global health diplomacy. And it's a science and an art, but it also has to be a commitment for all humanity. Because we know, and we knew this since 2014 with Ebola, that it only takes eight hours for a threat from over there to be a threat here. And so we have to realize, not just in rhetoric, but in practice of leaders, that um, we're all in this together. It's not just you know, rhetoric. The other thing is we have to re be really pragmatic in appreciating that our public health workforce, our healthcare workforce, is under strain and stress. We have to have governance that recognizes the need to radical investments in the pipeline of professionals and interprofessionals who work together. The science is really important. I am a molecular biologist and an epidemiologist, but governance has to realize that they have been underfunding science in behavioral, understanding human behavior, and they have underinvested in the implementation of the scientific knowledge and the tools uh, that we have. So we have to get to a level where governance is appreciating funding communities, funding regional health officers, equipping them with tools, and engaging in creating a safety net that goes from knowledge creation and creation of vaccines and therapeutics 
to explaining and motivating and cultivating that environment of trust for adopting behaviors that promote health for individuals, communities, families, and the world. So governance needs to step up in a lot of ways, not just in material ways, but also in bringing resources to underserved and underdeveloped areas. And one last thing, we have to deal with the disparities. Governance together have to work on addressing disparities between countries and within countries. Because we know from this pandemic that the vulnerable populations will be at risk for a pathogen or climate. And if we don't have a governance structure that's looking out for maintaining, uh, mitigating the risks in that population, again, all of us will, will be at risk. Thank you. Can yeah. I go maybe beyond um, where Michelle is? Because I agree with all that she said. But we also have to keep in mind there are limits to where the governance structure can go. And I think we have that practical experience now. Because when we formed COVAX, we had to put in place 50-odd innovations, things like indemnification and liability, no-fault compensation. We had to work on uh, you know, the export bans that existed. And some of them were very public of vaccines. But there was also um, materials that weren't being shared. And so one of the questions is, how far can we go with governance? And you know, Dr. Tedros and WHO is trying to come up with a pandemic treaty that will help help us move some of these forward. But the question is, can you legislate all of it? And one of the things we learned is there were countries who were supporting us, giving us money, cheering us on, and then going to the countries that were producing the vaccines and buying them for themselves and using them. And, and you know, at the end, a national government is supposed to protect its population. That's its job. And, and when we said you're only safe if we're all safe, what we were talking about is, yes, protect your high-risk populations, but then protect other high-risk populations. And instead, many countries said, well, I don't, you know, forget about others. We're just going to do our own. And then we saw these waves of disease and people realized it is really a global commons. So one of the things we have to think about is how do we, on top of governance, first of all, learn those lessons, really be honest about those lessons. And then second, what can we do to mitigate those as much as possible? So Stefan talked about one of them. So if we diversify more manufacturing, still doesn't guarantee that you'll be able to provide everybody, but it makes it more likely that you won't have lockdown everywhere. How do we put an, an example would be materials to make the vaccines. I mean, India had the capacity to make the vaccines, they didn't have the raw materials they needed. Well, they, they made two billion doses, but of course they use them mostly for India. Yeah. So I think the challenge in, in doing this is, is to be pragmatic and to be honest about what actually needs to happen. And that conversation gets quite complicated because it can be very theoretical. Um, you know, there, there is a, a flu um, a treaty that says that um, one out of every 10 doses produced is going to go to developing countries. Now, whether it should be 50% of the population lives there, whether it should be one out of 10, but will that work if there is a bad flu coming out? And how do we set up other um, uh, you know, uh, systems to be able to do that? Stefan. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to add to Steph's uh, point, on the governance, we are trying to really work with other entities, you know, CP, you know, WHO and others on how else do we do better next time? Even though, as Seth said, I mean, this was kind of a world record of vaccine development timelines. I still believe we can do much better with a lot of things we've learned about so how we scale the companies. Um, and so one of the things, for example, we're doing, I was just you know, discussing with Richard Hatch that we run CP before this meeting, is trying to get into the clinic all the 15 uh, vaccine against the 15 high priority uh, viruses defined by WHO and CP to be able to get clinical data on those. Because if we had known the dose of our vaccine against the coronavirus in January 2020, we might have seven other three months. So think about the number of lives that could have been saved with a vaccine launch you know, in August versus you know, in December. Um, and so we're trying to figure out a lot of things that we can do to just collaborate with academics around the world to open the Moderna platform we actually launched in March mRNA access, which is basically academics from Oxford or Australia or anywhere in the world, you know, the team in Tunisia is working to make a new rabies vaccine. So how do we really get this collaboration across the communities around the world to get those tools ready? So they can either be used when we have, you know, outbreaks or they can, can be used, you know, God forbid if we have another pandemic and to really be even better ready so we can go even faster on the 
clinical side of the house. And then the manufacturing, as we said, by having all those plants and the capacity, it's not only the number of plants for the export restriction, but also the capacity, you know, we had no capacity in January 2020. Uh, you know, when the vaccine was approved, it was actually a sad day for us. We shipped only 20 million doses. That's all we had. We emptied everything. We spent six months to make 20 million doses. Think about where we are now. You know, three, four billion doses. So in six months, if you could launch much faster, you could actually, the day of launch, ship two billion doses around the world. That would make such a difference in our number of lives. But let me just give one yeah. example practically. Um, we just had an Ebola um, Sudan outbreak in Uganda. Um, we had um, an Ebola Zaire vaccine. We actually launched it here at the World Economic Forum in advanced purchase agreement in 2015. And that vaccine has been used in all the Ebola outbreaks. But Sudan is a different strain. It turns out that almost spun completely out of control. It went to nine districts in Uganda, including the capital city. Now, thank goodness, they were well-trained public health practitioners, and what they were able to do was bring it under control. But the reason I bring this up is, ultimately, vaccines got delivered, but it got delivered after 80 days. Had it spun out of control, you know, we would have had a worldwide epidemic or even pandemic. What we need is those vaccines in vials, ready to go for the clinical trials or doing as much testing as you can ahead of time. And the challenge with that is, you know, if you don't have a Sudan, those, those vaccines are gonna expire. And so it's a few million dollars. And, and so, you know, the point here is we don't spend the money because we're worried about wasting those few million dollars for something that could, I mean, this, this pandemic has been a, probably a 12 to $15 trillion yeah. pandemic. We need in peacetime to make those investments. And, and to Chris. build on this point, what I worry about now is a lot of countries are forgetting. The pandemic is still ongoing, still as we say, you know, a lot of people are dying every day, but a lot of governments are moved to other things. And that's a problem because we need investments in public health infrastructure, in healthcare workers, in genomic surveillance. There's so many pieces that need to happen. I mean, in, industry can do so, so much, but we need the governments to really keep at it because we all know there's going to be other outbreaks, there's going to be, God forbid, another pandemic, and we need to be much better prepared that time. Marie, I would like to ask you about that specifically on the need of that investment and the importance of not forgetting for to have a better uh, future pandemic preparedness, because as you said, to be ready for whatever's, whatever's coming next. Yeah. So before I was negative about our ability to do the necessary to, in, uh, education um, against the uh, science, uh, disbelief in science, here I'm much more positive. And I have to say, I think we did extremely well We've heard it both from the logistic but also from the scientific side. The basic science was there and it was science that had been funded for completely different reasons. So two of the um, European uh, researchers uh, who, whose work led to vaccines, Adrian Hill in Oxford and Uwe Shaheen in Germany, had been funded uh, by a funder, namely the ERC, for their fundamental science to do something different. And um, let's not even talk about Katalin Kariko, who'd been working on this for 20 years. So we've been, we did extremely well. It was right there. We've heard the logistics, the production, the underlying science happened in record time without needing a warp speed funding from above. That did well, but the science was there. So my plea is keep investing in the basic science. Let's not forget that. The next pandemic, may be different, we don't even know. I mean, nature can come up with anything. Uh, we're prepared in many ways, and I'm very glad to hear from all of my colleagues about the ways in which we are prepared and which we've learned. Um, you know, the production, great. Um, but, so we, we've done the basic molecular biology, epidemiology, pr production, etc. I loved what Michelle said, understanding behavior. So a completely different aspect of understanding and research we need. Uh, I'm very glad to say that the ERC funds that kind of research. And it's a, it's a really privilege to work for a funding entity that recognizes the uh, need to fund the humanities and the social sciences. That, I think, needs a push, and I'm glad you brought it up. I would say that. We have learned. Um, and so, but uh, because we need all the other 
aspects that my colleagues have uh, said and that are obviously recognizable, I want to say don't restrict funding to the fundamental sciences in their full breadth. You'll never know what we'll need for the next outbreak. Thank you so much. We're going to take a few questions from the audience. If you could raise your hand. Can we have a question here first and then we're going to get there? Yeah. Um, Peter Davis from New Zealand, health sociologist. Um, I'm wondering what happened to the debate over the TRIPS IP waiver? Mm. None of you have mentioned this as being, was it an important discussion to have? Will it still be an important discussion to have for future epidemics in order to ensure that we get drugs out quickly to low and middle income countries? And who wants to take it? I'm happy to take it. Yeah. yeah. So, as we said at the time this was announced, we think it was politically driven. It would not have added one dose of vaccines because IP is only one part. Yeah. And during the pandemic, we actually said publicly in the fall of 2020 that we will not sue anybody who use our IP. Our IP is on the internet. You can go and read all of our patents, they're all there. All our papers have been out there. To be able to get products, you need manufacturing capacity, you need equipment, you need trained people, you need raw materials. And those things were all lacking. We didn't make more vaccine because we didn't want to. We didn't make more vaccine because we couldn't. And our teams worked literally seven days a week, all of 2020 and into 2021. And so that was the issue, which is for mRNA technology. There was no capacity in the world. There was capacity in the world for protein technology because it's a 50 plus year old technology. So a lot of capacity, but mRNA, there was just no plants. So it will not have helped one more vaccine. Can we have a question there? Yeah, the lady. Oh, sorry, we're going to go with that. Sorry. Megan Greenfield from McKinsey. I have a question. We talked about the distrust in science and that the few examples of successful vaccination, you know, were actually not focused on science. What would you recommend that countries do today to address the stagnating interest in vaccination? And what would you recommend doing differently in the next pandemic? Oh, let me take a start. Um, say what you will, Tony Fauci did a great deal in communicating the risk and the opportunities for mitigating risk at a national level. I think what we all have to recognize is in a diverse society, you're going to need to have layers and layers of communicators and different styles and ways of communicating. So I think the one thing that we should all learn is we make real investment in understanding the populations and the communities we're serving, reckon with the reasons there is distrust, and then work collaboratively and respectfully in addressing the appropriate message and messenger to really promote the change. And that's where a better understanding in behavioral sciences are going to help us. I mean, you know, pre-COVID, Aspen, and Sabin Institutes came together to work on trust even before you know, we really had to deal with the trust deficit. And part of it has to do with understanding who we're serving and marketing. I mean, I hate to use the word, but it, it is a kind of marketing for public health where you're encouraging people to do the thing in their best interest, society's best interest, and making them feel good about it. Thank you. Uh so I just want to, if I can just add one yeah, other point is, I mean, one of the challenges is, um, and you remember this, um, the, the number of experts that appeared in vaccines and had opinions, it was unbelievable how, and, 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 and one of the challenges is when you have the intentional misinformation. I mean, it's interesting, the U.S. scored, there was a, a, a scoring system for pandemic preparedness, and the U.S. and the U.K. scored the highest in, in the world in terms of being prepared. And yet, if you look at what actually happened, I mean, you know, a third of Americans aren't vaccinated and two-thirds aren't boosted. That is not about the preparedness that existed. It's about the political climate and, and misinformation that was spread. And that's really unfortunate because it shows the power of those systems to trump some of the work that was being done. And I, I think one of the things we have to think about is how we also deal, deal with that. And, and even other external experts who might have been able to help were then also demonized. And so it became very political. And that's, I worry about intentional politicalization of science versus, as 
Michelle said, you know, rightfully, a lot of people ask, you know, hey, these vaccines were made really quick. Did we do the right things? Did we check the safety? Did, and the answer was yes, but we need to, you know, answer those concerns. We're going to briefly take the final go there. Just on the same issue of the infodemic, basically, I work for an organization that trains journalists around the world, and we've trained a ton of journalists on the coverage of COVID. What are some of the bright spots that you saw with the news media? I know they were part of the problem, but were there places that you saw some bright spots about how the news media covered the pandemic? Thank you so much for this question from all the media organizations here. Uh, anybody wants to take that for, for the positive examples? Well, I, I really think, you know, when we talk about... Um, better understanding among the populations. Many say researchers should learn better how to communicate. I think journalists should be given much greater access to, um, uh, to us, the scientists. I mean, there's one program in the world, one program in the world, the McKnight program at MIT, that helps journalists do that. And uh, we really need more of that. There's two, the yeah. Neiman Foundation as well. And what I just learned, because the pandemic made me think hard about how do we encourage my faculty, faculty across universities to engage with journalists. And it's building a relationship. And it's also having programs like the Knight Foundation, like the Neiman, um, come together and create fellowship opportunities. Um, the pandemic allowed me to do something as a dean of a school of public health that I'd never thought of doing before. When we kept getting calls and our faculty, Mark Lipsitch, for example, you know, modeling in the night and talking to the media in the day, uh, we realized that we couldn't just have one journalist, one scientist talk to each other. So we actually set up you know, press briefings where we had the professors available to speak with the journalists from anywhere. And that helped, and I think we should try to keep doing more of those. The other thing I'd recognized is we had stopped investing in health journalists. Those jobs were disappearing. So a sports journalist was covering the pandemic. Yep. Yep. And that made it even more necessary for us to engage. Yeah, I think Daily everybody newspapers. did. Everybody Daily tried to do papers. Yeah. No longer have yes. fully employed journalist editors, Absolutely. Uh, 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 science editors. Yeah. Amazing. I wish we had more time, but we're going to go now for the closing remarks by Shan Bishan, Hatch Shaping the Future of Health and Healthcare, member of the Executive Committee at the World Economic Forum. The floor is yours for the closing remarks. Thank you, Sasa. So on behalf of the World Economic Forum, I just wanted to take two minutes to thank you, Shasa, for moderating such a great session. It's been wonderful discussion, wonderful conversation here. Thank you, Maria, Sait, Michelle. Stefan, great work, great discussion here. Uh, on the world, from our side, from World Economic Forum side, ever since the pandemic started, we have been trying to bring people together, both public and private sector, to respond to this. We have been working on few initiatives. Set and Stefan and Michelle are part of some of those uh, initiatives. Uh, we know that outbreaks will happen. The way the population is increasing, the way we live now, we're getting closer to the woods, germs, pathogens, they are getting closer to, uh, to us through animals and other sources. So outbreaks will happen. How do we stop them from becoming full-blown pandemics? That's the question. And that's where we are working on to see if we can monitor these pathogens, catch them early on, come up with medical countermeasures, diagnostics, vaccines, treatments, sooner you do that, better off you are. So that's one thing. I think the world has the scientific and technical know-how. I mean, you, you see that here. Uh, and we, if we don't have it, we can develop it very quickly. We have the financial resources. The idea is to bring this all together. This needs an international collaboration. This needs partnership. This needs both public and private uh, partnership. We need the political will to bring all these things together. So that's something that we want to work on. We want to bring these people together to do this. Um, development banks, WHO, Gavi, private sector, they all have to be together working with the health ministers, working with the finance ministers. We had a great session yesterday on healthcare policy. 
where we start to talk about how the finance ministers should treat healthcare cost not as a cost anymore, it's an investment. You must invest in healthcare now and you tackle these problems. So that's one thing. And in that area, we have actually created a initiative called Pathogen Surveillance uh, Initiative where we are working with Africa CDC, we are working with other stakeholders to do just that. Make sure we have, we create, we have access to data, data is in one place, especially right now we are working on Africa continent and people have access to that data as soon as possible to again respond with medical countermeasures. <coughs> so that's one initiative. The other one that the forum is working on, again with Seth and uh, Stefan, is what you said, Michelle, to make sure that there are no disparities. So making sure that there are no disparities in vaccine access, we have an initiative called Regionalized Vaccine Manufacturing Collaborative that we are working with, oh, right now we have about 95 or 96 members in that. Make sure that there is vaccine manufacturing in every continent. It's impossible to do it in every country, but you can do it in every continent. And that manufacturing facility should be versatile. It can take different technologies to make vaccines. So that's the thing we are working on. I know we are out of no, time. No, 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 absolutely. Uh, but, uh, but there are some things that we can do. I mean, there are a lot of things, good things that have happened here. Uh, Seth Manson, Gavi was created here. Global Fund, many other things were created in Davos. And we want to make sure we continue the, the great work here, working with all of you. So thank you. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you very much.